Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our fifth installation of Q&A with Mr. Mikelski. And these are your astronomy unanswered questions. So hopefully you can get some answers. Maybe they're good, maybe they're not, but they're mine. And that's good enough for today. All right, uh, we have Nivik <laughs> has asked a few questions. So let's see what Nivik's questions are. Uh, do you think someone will ever invent a time machine? Ooh, I like this question. And you know what? I love the sci-fi movies. There's actually a movie called Time Machine. I think that's what it was. Um, and I feel like they tried getting into, like, the, the reality of it. And not, like, super, you know, science fact, but, um, but kind of, like, what could happen? <laughs> and from my understanding of time and, and the way that works, uh, I think... I don't, I don't think we're going to invent the time machine. Not, not in the way that like the DeLorean works or the, the, the typical sci-fi movies and, and simply because of a couple things. One, if we did, and people say this all the time, if some human somewhere in the future invented a time machine and it was capable of traveling in time, why wouldn't we know about it? Why wouldn't we be aware that somebody probably came and traveled back in time? Because I don't know about you, but if I had a time machine, I'd probably travel back in time. I'd probably travel forward in time. I'd probably go all over the place in time and figure, like, what could I mess with? Or how could I, you know, be like Biff and, like, make my family rich and, you know, like, change my future and all the other great things, okay, or, or horrible things, you know, whatever that may be. Um, so that, that's one thing, kind of a little bit of a um, thought as to why time machines might not actually exist. Uh, the other thought, though, is maybe time machines could exist, but they might be limited. And we talked about this a little bit in our relativity unit, but the idea that maybe if we could travel in time, maybe we would be locked into only traveling into the future. And from the standpoint, if you think about it, whether if you call it fate or free will or, or um, um, there's other words for that, but anyways, um, that like a, a final destination, something. The idea that the past is already written it's, it's like it's done. So we can't go back and, and change that. It's already been had versus if I go into the future, well, in a way, the future hasn't existed yet. So I could do that. And if I change it, well, how would I know if I was changing it? Because this is the first time it's existed. Now, the problem with that becomes if I could travel into the future, didn't the future have to already exist for me to go there? So then I think that what brings the really good thought question is if time travel were ever possible, then that would mean that all times that you could ever travel to already exist, both past and future, and that they must always exist for you to be able to, at any point in time, choose to go to them. So you kind of get into this weird paradox slash, you know, um, multiverse loop that every possibility of time and therefore of our universe must always exist and so that kind of breaks my mind a little bit but uh but it'd be really cool to figure out or at least for somebody to try it out all right that was a good question all right next one uh has anyone tried to push hard against einstein's theories um, assuming you mean like trying to figure out if, if he's wrong or, or trying to challenge the theories or, or see, you know, if we can go beyond his theories. I don't know. I don't have any like hard evidence to provide one way or the other, but I, my, my gut says that, yes, I'm sure that that had to have happened. Um, and, and then the reason I say that is because in my opinion, any good scientist is, is not going to be content with just take what the, the last guy did and, and be good with that uh, guy, girl, person, anybody, it doesn't matter. But to push, push the boundaries, push the envelope of, of our understanding. Um, because even Einstein, for as, as amazing of, of a physicist and mathematician and, and everything that he did, um, like that was over a hundred years ago. So his fundamental understandings were based off of the most modern science at that time and that science is over a hundred years old now almost like 115 years old for some of his theories that he came up with so 
what we have learned in the last 115 years is stuff that he would not even have an idea of. I mean, like he maybe he could have thought it, just like anybody else could randomly think things, but but like that would not have been in like his scientific, you know, realm of, of knowledge, um, simply because it didn't exist yet in, in terms of like our our human understanding. So from that, I, I do think people have tried. And, and I think that there are bounds beyond what Einstein believed. And, and there's actually been uh, evidence to suggest that Einstein was wrong on some things. Einstein did not really care for the idea of quantum theory uh, from the standpoint of quantum mechanics and the, the, the understanding of things that are very small. There's something called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which basically says that the more accurate you are about measuring one quantity, the less you are accurate about another quantity, the property of some object. Um, and so, it's all has to do with something called statistics and and um, this this wave function, but there's this randomness and and at that quantum level, if you've ever seen, um, you know, what Ant Man and things like that, where they go into the quantum realm and, and things like that in the Marvel uh, universe, but the idea that there are these quantum fluctuations and it is in its own sense a form of chaos uh, that Einstein is famous for quoting. Or his he has a famous quote that says, "God does not play dice with the with the universe," and that was his way of basically saying he believes in, in, in God or some form of, of that, and that he did not believe that there are these random fluctuations that cannot be currently explained. Um, and yet, all evidence suggests that quantum theory is correct. And it is a better model for understanding the way things work on that very, very tiny scale. And so just because Einstein didn't like it, it didn't sit well with him, doesn't make it wrong. Uh, and so, again, it's a different perspective. Actually, the, the, the issues that come up now with physicists and, and science is that we're trying to resolve Einstein stuff, which was like big, high energy, you know, relativity, very fast moving, large amounts of gravity, things like that, all, all like the, the big universe type stuff, right? With the quantum realm the very very small things and, and so there's it's hard to reconcile those two things together and so that's where string theory comes into play and so string theory is kind of the attempt to merge the ideas of quantum mechanics and quantum theory with relativity because right now those two like are really they butt heads so not only uh, einstein is a human being not liking the ideas of quantum mechanics but his theories of relativity also kind of don't really fit well with that. So it's kind of fascinating, but for sure, um, people, I'm, I'm positive people are pushing to try to continue to continue his work, but also to try to check if it's right and then further, you know, go beyond it. All right, that was good. Uh, are aliens really being hidden from people on Earth? Well, if I told you this, I'd probably have to kill you. So I probably shouldn't tell you about it, but now I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I... You know, like Area 51 and all that kind of, you know, stuff. The conspiracy theories are fun. I love, you know, the movies like Independence Day and, and you know, whatever else you can think about. Um, actually, another really good movie, not really a... The point of the movie, in my opinion, wasn't had nothing to do with, like, aliens, although it did. Uh, but it was called The Arrival. I, I just really liked that one. It was a good concept. Uh, very interesting. But anyways, so highly recommend it. Um but if aliens were here and we knew about it as humans, I'm sure governments or, or whoever was knowledgeable of it would, would try to hide it from the mass population. Um, why? To prevent mass hysteria, to research, to um, maybe to hide, you know, the, the information that they did know. Uh, or maybe, what if this, what if we like found an alien and it was like super lame? Then like all the hype and people be like, oh, what does it do? I don't know. It's just like it's this thing, and it's kind of like a human, or it's kind of like nothing like a human. But what if the alien civilization was, I don't know, like 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 a dog, or you know, like and that's a silly example, but you know, it was something like very mundane and and just not very interesting. Then I think it'd be exciting from a scientific standpoint to be like, hey, look, there was this this life, this like macro organism that was formed somewhere else. Now, granted, if it's here on Earth, the chances of it being like a dog is not very likely, right? It probably have to be something quite intelligent, um, technologically advanced to be able to get here. So all of those things would certainly have to be true, in my opinion. Um, now, if it could do all those things, is it 
going to be like captured by humans that are sitting down here with our little metal bullets and you know whatever things that we use that we consider advanced i wouldn't think so but who knows um so you know again in the movies we always seem to find a way we rally together and we you know defeat the aliens because they've always got some some big flaw that they you know leave uncovered but um i I'm going to say my personal opinion is I don't think so. I don't think that there's really aliens being hidden from people on Earth. And maybe I'm super naive, but I just, I don't buy into that kind of stuff that much. So that's my thought. Like it or not. All right. Thank you, Nivik. <laughs> there's some good questions. All right. Here's another set. This is from Kendall3. All right. Code name, Kendall3. All right. Where in the galaxy are the most stars born? I don't know. I mean, I feel like this is a, should be a pretty straightforward question now. Okay, if you mean like, generally speaking, like all stars are born in like star nurseries, which is like uh, gas clouds and nebulae, no, like nebula, right, nebulae, multiple nebulas. Um, and so from that standpoint, that is like where stars are created, where they're born because it's where the gas clouds collect and, you know, condense until eventually there's enough gravity that forms a little like stuff. And then it collects enough stuff until it ignites, becomes, you know, fusion becomes a thing and it's now a star. So that is like a very good general answer and that's accurate. But if they're like, is there a specific, like, here's a high star forming region, um, it's kind of all over. Uh, if you look at our galaxy, it's kind of all over. And I would actually wonder if closer to the core of the galaxy, which is ironically is a supermassive black hole, but like not all the way to the center, but like kind of nearish, but around it, where you're going to have much more activity. Now, pros and cons. More activity might mean there's more matter, there's more stuff bumping into each other, there's more kind of movement, if you will. So it might allow these particles and, and you know gas and stuff to, to collect more easily and kind of form. But at the same time, if they're too close to the center, then they're gonna get start getting pulled into the you know the black hole and it'll rip it apart and you wouldn't have the opportunity to form a star. So um, I think there's gonna be kind of that, that Goldilocks zone in the same way that we have a Goldilocks zone, but more related to water and life on Earth. Um, there might be kind of that sweet spot of of the most you know planet or uh, not planet, but stel stellar creation. Um, but I, I think in general, in our galaxy, they're going to be all over the place. Okay. Um, next question. All right. Does every black hole contain a singularity? Yes. I believe by definition it would because the singularity is the, the, the nugget, the, the oyster, if you will strike that the pearl inside the oyster uh in the sense that it is that that collapsed core of whatever was okay most likely a star or again if they're talking about supermassive black holes for the center of galactic uh, nuclei the nucleus of a galaxy um then it may be not like a single star but the stuff that that formed and that fell into that black hole that caused it to be and that continued to you know fuel it and and so on um but that my understanding is that yes, they all would have a, a singularity. The singularity being the theoretical point at which is the center of the black hole. Um, if you thought about black hole, it's really a sphere, right? It's a sphere, spherical shape. So in space, it would still be spherical. You don't really see it because the way, especially the way it warps light. So what it looks like is very different. Um, I highly recommend go look at a picture of a black hole. We have them now. Um, and if you don't look at the actual picture of the black hole, definitely you can look at um, simulations showing what it would look like. And those are fairly accurate, I believe. Um, but the point is that the singularity is that collapsed core. So if, if the black hole is the sphere, that's like the, um, the short still radius, right? That's the radius at which the event horizon exists. And that's the, the, the dark part, the black part of the hole, if you will. But if that's like, let's say, uh, uh, the surface of a, of a beach ball, then there's like a grain of sand is in the center of that beach ball. And that is what the singularity is. Because the, there is no surface at that event horizon. It's just the edge 
at which light is not traveling fast enough to be able to escape, right? Even the speed of light is not fast enough to escape the gravitational pull. So beyond that, you get stuff orbiting, but anywhere closer and it all falls in and does not escape. And so that's why it, within that, that region, it's black, it's dark, but that's not like the surface of it. There's no like surface of a black hole at the event horizon. The, the surface, if there was one, would be down like deep in the core and that would be what the singularity is referring to. All right. One more question. Here we go. Um, I believe I answered this already, but why is the sky blue? So again, my understanding of why the sky is blue is has to do with scattering of light. Um, the light that comes to us from the sun is actually white light. And that's why if you ever shine it through a prism or through a, a, a piece of glass that happens to be shaped in a certain way, or even for that matter, a raindrop, right? Uh, you get rainbows. And the rainbows that you see are all of the colors that make up that visible light. And so the Roy G. Biv of the rainbow is actually the light that is coming from the sun, but it, when it comes all together, it appears to us as white light. So now what happens when that white light hits the particles in our atmosphere, uh, the certain size and shape of those particles happens to scatter that light at different amounts. Um, and so the scattering happens where the shorter the wavelength, which would be more like your reds and blues, scatters less. So we see it more as the sun is like directly above us. And the reds scatter more, because it's a longer wavelength, so they scatter away, I believe is the correct way of saying this. And so then on the other side of it though, as the sun is setting, where the sunlight has to go through more atmosphere, if you think of it going through like the, the Earth's atmosphere kind of at an angle, if you will, as opposed to perpendicular to the surface, um, then it's going to have to go through more. So there is more scattering to be done. So the blue light that doesn't scatter as much is like already gone, right? It doesn't reach uh, our eyes, but the stuff that does scatter is what gets to us. And so that's why we see those reds and, and yellows. All right. So fun fact that I didn't think, I don't think I mentioned in the last time I answered this question was this though. If you think about it, when we are seeing the sun set, here in Illinois, and let's say California still has the sun, you know, higher up in the sky, so it's, you know, or even go, go further, go Hawaii or something like that, right? Hawaii's blue sky is the blue light that is taken out of what we see as our red sky and vice versa, but it's like the same light, that white light that has blues in it, has reds in it, has yellows, it has, you know, all these other colors in it. And there's certain colors that are a little more prominent than others. You don't see a lot of greens too much, but you know they're kind of in there a little bit. Um, but it's the scattering of the red light. The red light that Hawaii doesn't see is the red light that we see as our sunset. The red light that we see as our sunset is the red light that they don't see as their blue skies and vice versa, right? We don't see the blue skies because they see it, but we see the red skies and they don't. Uh, so anyways, it, it, it does go together with those two concepts. And the same thing is true actually even in the morning, um, although it's kind of in reverse, right? As the sun's light gets to you first, then you see those reds and oranges and yellows. And then as the sun gets higher up in the sky, more perpendicular to the surface of the earth, then it turns more bluish. Um, and it has to do with the, I want to say it's the water molecules in the air, as well as uh, some other gases, because different gases would actually produce uh, different colored light, and, and that depends on the size of the particles. Um, I know this is going a little long, but there's a fun video um, by a MIT physics professor, Walter Lewin, and he wrote a book, actually. It's a really good book. It's called For the Love of Physics. But anyways, there's a, one of his lectures. He, uh, and I don't know if he was a smoker usually, but he, he gets a couple of cigarettes and he smokes it in his lecture hall, all right, so in college. But um, he's got like an overhead projector. And what he shows is that when he inhales a bunch of cigarette smoke, he holds it in his lungs. And the reason he does that is because actually what it, the smoke does is it kind of clings to the, the water vapor that's in your breath and in your, in your lungs. And so then what he did is he exhaled that, that cigarette smoke, which we would see normally as like kind of a whitish colored smoke. But by holding in, in a little bit longer, the particles got just a little bit bigger. There's a certain size uh, of those particles that now when he exhaled over this projector of white light, 
he actually created a blue sky inside this lecture hall. And the effect is, is pretty awesome. I mean, it's still kind of mild, but the idea that by simulating the effect of white light passing through the certain size particle, again, particle of smoke, vapor, and, and uh, the moisture um, together to create what we call blue sky. Um, it was actually pretty impressive. Uh, I don't know how much it would hurt his health to, to do this and how often he does it in a lecture, um, but it was, it was a cool effect to see for sure. So, all right, with that, that was a nice long answer, a lot of pieces to it. Um, I am out of questions for today. So I will thank you for joining me and hope you got something out of this session. Uh, if you haven't seen the other four, go check them out. Otherwise, stay tuned for another one in the future. See you next time.